Hey everyone, Irene Lyon here. Welcome to this entire world of nervous system health and healing. I am very excited for what I have for you today. It is an interview with expert, guest expert, Jessica Ash. Jessica is someone who I found via the Instagram worlds about a year or so ago when I was working with some hormone stuff in my own system and just really wanting to get a better check on what I do for my health, how I feed myself, how I fuel myself. And I must say, some of the things I have practiced and implemented as a result of following her have really helped me and I think they might help you. So I wanted to have her on to talk about why as a human culture, especially in the Western world, we are obsessed with stress-based eating why it feels so good to go into fasting and ketosis. We get into this. We also talk about the connection between glucose. So the glucose that we need for our brain to function and our cells to function, not like candy and sugar, right? So blood glucose in relationship to thyroid function, liver function, and just general cellular health. This is a really interesting topic because it, it bridges so well with my work around survival stress, what keeps us in fight, flight, and freeze. And believe it or not, even if we heal all of our traumas and are fully regulated, if we eat in a way that stresses out our body and our organ systems, we're not doing ourselves any favors. So I really want everyone to listen to this one because it is incredibly important, maybe for you or maybe someone you know, or maybe your clients who you work with. It's just such inf such important information. Um, we couldn't cover everything in her scope just as someone wouldn't be able to understand what I do in one hour. So I will definitely be having her back on to talk about other factors around cellular health and nutrition and wellness and being fully nourished. So check it out, have a listen, take some notes, and consider what it might be like to implement some of the things that she's talking about. Um, and all I can say is um, I'm really, really glad that you are here listening to this because this just might shift how your system heals and how it gets better regulated at this nervous system level. Thank you everyone and enjoy the chat. Hey there, Jessica, welcome. Hi, Irene. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, you're so welcome. And um, as we were talking about before we hit record, I said to you, it's going to be impossible to get everything out of your brain and in your expertise out in under an hour. And the, the main point of me saying this to anyone listening to this is please usually we say this at the end of the interview, but please go to Jessica's site all the links are near here because you cover not just what we're going to talk about today but so much more around hormones and health and all that stuff yes. so um that's the the preamble for the ending there Absolutely. um what i want to talk to you about um is the importance of us specifically women but this is men too right there's no reason why this can't be for the guys Absolutely not. um being fully nourished and i know that's sort of your tag and one of your programs. As a general rule, can you tell me what that means for you? And is there a story around your health and your journey that led you to have this idea of we need to teach people how to be fully nourished? Absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, in this world, in this realm of just so many different diets and belief systems around food, I think we can get caught up in the, the more logical side of food. And we've kind of been taught that food boils down to data and macronutrients and micronutrients, but food is so much more. It's, um, it's a tradition, it's cuisine, it's art and it's feeling. And it, it has a, almost a spiritual component to it because mm -hmm. it is our energy and it's what we, how we give our bodies energy and nourishment can look so different for all of us. But at the end of the day, it's so important for our body to have the fuel that it needs so that we can show up in the way that we need to in the world at the in the truest and fullest expression of ourselves. Mm -hmm. For me, I had to learn this the hard way. Um, as most people in the health and wellness realm do, they, uh, we always kind of have our own story. For me, it started really young. Um, I've had digestive issues and health issues since I can remember since I was, you know, my first memories 
20s. And as I went through puberty, I had lots of hormonal issues, which developed into autoimmune conditions. And so by the time I was 20, I ended up being diagnosed with just a plethora of things from lupus to Hashimoto's to celiac disease to PCOS to prediabetes and not really sure what was going on with me, but it did kind of catapult me into a journey to really start to understand my own system and understand my body. And as kind of naturally, it usually happens, I came across all these restrictive diets. And so Mm -hmm. I went down my own rabbit hole with, you know, from paleo to keto to carnivore to intermittent fasting. And what I found as I became more and more restricted, of course, some issues improved Mm -hmm. and I felt better, but I kept kind of going to the next thing, becoming more restrictive and more restrictive. And I got to a point where I couldn't eat anything more than just meat and water. (laughs) (laughs) And I I was feeling worse, if not better. And I could see on my face, I felt gaunt and my energy was low. And I kind of talked in this monotone voice. And I knew like, Mm. this is not Jessica. This is not who she is. And so it really led me to re go to the books and to really relearn how the body actually functions and what the body needs to thrive and to reshape what I believe health to be, which Mm -hmm. is being energized and being able to live you know, the fullest quality of life and not to be continually obsessed and consumed with health, but to have health that allows you to show up in the world and have the quality of life that you want. And so that kind of has led me to teaching, um, I guess, a fully nourished method (laughs) that I do today. Yeah, it's wonderful. And I came across your work maybe about eight months ago, um, as I was sort of hitting that that age where um, one might say, we are we are no longer in reproductive years. I still am, but um, there was a sh- there was a significant gear shift in my hormones, and I will be honest. I thought I was bulletproof against that because I have regulation. I've worked on so much trauma, and the this is I think one of the things I've changed my mind on. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, as we age, we change our mind on certain things, and it, it one of the things is you still need to look at your nutrition, your activity, no matter how regulated you are in your nervous system, no matter how much trauma and emotional processing you've done, your body still needs fuel every single day and it changes based on all sorts of factors. Um, I wanted to ask, what were you interested in being in the health and wellness realm when this landed on you? when you were diagnosed, quote unquote, with all these things, what's that trajectory like? You know, I always was interested in the human body since I was very young. Uh, When I was four, my family used to call me the doctor because I would walk (laughs) around and I would want to look in people's ears and look in people's noses and I would ask them questions about their health. So I think I always had that part of me, but I got distracted. And um, during that time, I was very much pushing, pushing, pushing for a very different career trajectory. Mm -hmm. I was, I was absolutely in a trauma response to where I was just all about accomplishing as much as I possibly could and becoming as powerful as I could. And um, that was either going to lead me to law school or medical Mm -hmm. school. Um, But my body said, no way. (laughs) And I already was very interested in health as a hobby. And this really, I, it became almost my full-time job to heal myself. And then I realized I naturally was pouring that into others. And it just kind of became a natural cadence to turn into what I do today. So right. yes, it was always there deep down, but um, yeah. my body kind of told me like, you're going this way. <laughs> exactly. And just uh, out of curiosity, what's the time frame from that moment we could say ground zero to now like how how long did it take you because people always want to know how long did it take you to get out of that crazy um unwell undernourished state yeah to where you got to a place where it's like wow i feel like a different person this is really important yeah so i i I, it's kind of a a different try to now it's been 12 years Mm -hmm. um since that moment that ground zero moment to now um but i have Along the way, if I would have not jumped from restrictive diet to restrictive diet, it probably would have been a lot faster. My experimentation years took about five years <laughs> of just jumping from thing to thing and naturopath to naturopath and dietitian to dietitian until I really realized like I have to 
stop mm. contracting out and I really got to take this into my own hands. Um, and then from there, really, uh, once I realized how important nourishment was, it took me about one to two years to feel really my best self. Um, so mm. the difference was incredible. Like I actually saw transformation quite quickly. Yeah. Um, but I would say that these, this journey usually takes, I, I've taken so many students and clients through and it can vary based on your history, but usually like one to three years is I know that's like a long period of time for someone that's suffering, but one mm. to three years as the body really regulates itself and finds safety from our habits, uh, it, it can really take about a one to three years. I would actually say that's not very and, long. Right. Um, being in the business that I'm in, and I want to make a parallel between what you just said and those following me who are interested in healing the nervous system and regulation. What you just said, how if, if you had just gone into this at the beginning, it would have been faster, but you took about five years of dabbling in all the diets. Yes. To me, that's parallel and synonymous to when I work with people who have tried the meditation retreats, the plant medicines, the biohacking. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't mean that these things don't have a time and a place, just like mm -hmm. I think certain diet protocols might help for a moment as a therapeutic benefit, maybe, and I'd love to hear Great. your thoughts on that. But you know, people will be EMDRing themselves to death, not <laughs> realizing that they're re-traumatizing themselves and putting themselves into override and into shutdown. Um, same with uh, cold plunging to death, where mm -hmm. it's like, oh, someone says this is gonna help my vagus nerve and relax it. It's, well, actually it's shutting it down even more and driving you into more freeze. Mm -hmm. So again, it's hard sometimes for folks to go, okay, I'm not going to follow a protocol. I'm just going to learn about my body and learn what it needs and know that this language, this new language is going to take a little time to uncover, unravel, and then speak fluently to use another metaphor, a metaphor there. Absolutely. I hope Absolutely. That makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah, and it took me a very long time to learn the difference between something that felt good short term but left me having I always I kind of look at it as paying the debt on it later. I kept, you know, doing something that would steal from my future. And over time I really realized there's a big difference between something that suppresses symptoms like these therapeutic diets or cold plunges, things like that versus actually healing the root at what's driving those symptoms. And that can be a lot more difficult. Unfortunately, it just takes more time and the body does have to go through those really ebbs and flows of where as you uncover the next layer, the body has to really go through it and, and rebalance it. And that can take time and effort and energy and it can be a much harder road, but it is the road of healing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I want to shift gears to sort of a, we could say a scenario, maybe the common typical thing you see doing, the mistakes people make, um, because you this is your expertise, how do you want to take us down this path of being undernourished, um, the importance of carbohydrates, we're thyroid, I think we're going to maybe touch on thyroid mm -hmm. where that comes in, because these things are not individual things, they all mm -hmm. coalesce and work together. So how would you like to take that off, take that take that into explaining for people? Yeah, yeah. So I always say, well, it's always best to kind of go back to the beginning. Yeah. And when we talk about food and fuel, I I always know that everyone's coming from a very different place. And we have to understand that food is so much more than just being, you know, the macronutrients on your plate or the, you know, the data, the energy, the ingredient label. It is is spiritual in a sense for a lot of us. And we have different relationships with food depending on what was modeled to us in our formative years, um, especially women, especially if you had mothers or aunts or the women in your life, grandmothers that talked poorly about their body or talked poorly about food, even if they fed you well, you absorbed mm -hmm. what they were thinking and feeling around food. And then bringing that up into uh, as we grow and as we mature, sometimes we carry that baggage with us into um, into life and we become more susceptible to the lies of diet culture. Mm -hmm. And that really starts us to, you know, we might have beliefs around food that we don't even really know that we have. And a lot of what I see with, especially with women, but men too, is that, you know, food causes weight gain. So the less you eat, the better it is. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have this, this society right now that's very on... <laughs> 
on the road to intermittent fasting and keto and it's all about restriction 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 where can we restrict more where can we punish ourselves a little bit more where can we um you know and and it does to me it comes down to there's a fear around food yeah. There's fear there and there's yeah. often some shame and there's often some guilt and it drives our food decisions and it also drives our susceptibility to these kind of re- extreme restrictive diets because we couldn't possibly be able to have a good relationship with food. We couldn't possibly be able to enjoy our food and find pleasure from our food without just binging or <laughs> overeating ourselves to obesity. But these are kind of the thoughts that we have uh, around food and around our body and it shapes what we choose and how how we approach food and fuel mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but what women and really everyone I, yeah, I, I, human. I normally start to humans speak you can to say women. humans <laughs> yes what humans need to understand is you need fuel to function and this has been known since the dawn of man you need fuel to have the energy to do the things that you want to do and to show up in the world the way that you want to show up And a lot of us, because we haven't been taught to just meet our body's basic needs, we don't even know what it looks like to just have a meal, have a healthy meal, sit down with people, enjoy your meal time, you know, be not be stressed around your food, Mm -hmm. have a balanced meal. A lot of us have to go back to the basics and learn how to fuel ourselves well and meet our body's basic needs well. And that one of those basic needs is food. And when we don't do that, the energy, and this goes through for everything, even as you heal and emotionally regulate, your body has to process these things. And processing takes energy. And processing our surroundings and our environment takes energy. And the energy that we're consuming really creates a state of resilience or non-resilience. And the more resilient we are, the better our nervous system can handle what's thrown at it. Mm-hmm. Thank you. And just a, a point of clarification for those that don't know, a macronutrient is fat, mm-hmm. protein, protein, and carbohydrate. Mm-hmm. Those are the main building blocks of our food. I know alcohol, it's its own thing when it comes yes. to grams and calories mm-hmm. per gram, but we'll leave mm-hmm. alcohol alcohol out today. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> That's another topic all in itself. Right. Um, but one of the things that I have seen, and I actually have your, I get your emails, mm. and I love the title from your last email. I, it was something like the things I hate or the things that drive me crazy. Yeah, this is the worst. <laughs> this is the worst. And you know, I've, uh, I, I feel bad for the potato. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I want to like apologize to it and the yam and the sweet potatoes and the squashes and all these really good complex carbohydrates that have so much nutrition. And I think that keto carnivore intermittent fasting world has almost uh, put us into amnesia around the, 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 where these things come from, the ancestral roots of these foods, you know, there, it's not by accident that, these things grow in earth and grow in earth really well and preserve a long time in a cool dark place right i don't think that's a coincidence so can you talk a bit about this fear of carbohydrate but also why carbohydrate is so important for our bodies of course in addition to fat and protein but it seems to be just left out Yes, yes, you are. You, we regularly are seeing now a lot of nutrition professionals will always say protein, fat, and fiber, and they will kind of leave mm. out carbohydrate as an important aspect of the diet. And as ancestral eating has kind of infiltrated the health and wellness sphere, what we've, what I've noticed is that there's an assumption that we know exactly what all of our ancestors were eating, which mm. is just kind of funny to me. It's ridiculous because all of our ancestors were eating very, very differently depending on the region that they lived. Yes. I always tell people there are people that live on 80% yam and 20% crickets over here uh-huh. and they live to be 105, you know, and then there's people over here that are eating, you know, straight whale blubber and yep. they live also to be 95. So what, 
what ancestors are we talking about? Because if we're just kind of grouping them all together as like our ancestors ate this much fat and this much protein, this much carbohydrate, you're going to maybe hurt yourself if you're somebody whose ancestors ate a really high carbohydrate diet and you've adapted to be able to eat a lot of carbs. Now, everybody's different and some people Mm -hmm. need a little less and some people need a little bit more. But really it comes down to, especially if you're focused in on, on the health of your nervous system and creating resilience, stress resilience, your nervous system requires about a 130 grams and that's just an average of glucose per day just to function that's the brain and the spinal cord and then Mm -hmm. includes the enteric nervous system as well that kind of reaches into the digestive tract Mm -hmm. and depending also you know we can add on the stressors of the day if you're someone that uses a lot of brain power for your job or you're, you're running around with your children that could greatly increase and the biggest lie that's kind of permeated is that the brain can run on fat and what you actually see is that the brain can only run on fat in the key areas needed for survival. So these systems are backup systems that when you're in a famine or you're in a stress state, your body will be able to survive. But there's a difference between surviving and thriving. And when the body is in a survival mode, it functions very differently. It becomes a lot more efficient, which efficiency with the body is not what you want. You don't want your body cutting corners and saying, oh, I'll repair that later or I'll stuff that into storage for later. We don't want our body cutting corners, but that's what happens because the body begins to focus on just surviving in the moment rather than thriving into the future. And so if your goal is just survival, your diet is going to look a lot different than a diet that's based around resilience and nourishment and really being able to thrive. And so when it comes to carbohydrates, everybody has a need for carbohydrate. And if you're not consuming them, you're going to be manufacturing glucose. And the manufacture of glucose, unfortunately requires your body's stress systems, primarily the adrenal glands. Um, they They will secrete primarily cortisol, which is your main catabolic hormone, which catabolic, all it means is your body cannibalizes or breaks yeah, down breaks its own down. tissue and then maybe transforms it. And to make glucose, our body has to catabolize our usually our muscle tissue, but if it, it doesn't want to break down muscle tissue, it will break down skin tissue, liver tissue, intestinal tissue, brain tissue, any tissue is free game. And the body will take those proteins, send them to the liver, and then the liver will go through a process called gluconeogenesis, mm-hmm. which is the process process of taking protein and turning it into glucose. And then the liver will secrete the glucose into the bloodstream and there you go, the cells that need glucose will take up glucose. So that's a very stressful and inflammatory process for the body to go through constantly. It also puts the liver under stress because now the liver has to focus on making fuel for you on top of its other 500 jobs. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Don't do that. (laughs) Right. And so all these people that are having really hard time detoxifying, detoxification, it's oftentimes because their liver is preoccupied with other things like survival. And so detoxification goes on the back burner. And another big thing that goes on the back burner is our thyroid hormone because our thyroid manufactures a thyroid hormone called T4 at the direction of our pituitary uh, gland, which secretes something called TSH or thyroid stimulating hormone, which most people, that's what they get tested at the doctor. Mm -hmm. Um, But once the thyroid responds to the thyroid stimulating hormone, it will create T4, which is actually a pretty inactive form of of thyroid hormone. And then that T4 will go to the liver and the liver will primarily be the organ that converts the T4 to the active form of thyroid hormone T3, which was what we're concerned with. And that's what the cells actually use to be able to utilize energy. And so that's why when you're hypothyroid or you're feeling, uh, if your thyroid hormone is suppressed by the stress, you will feel like you're kind of swimming underwater or you're exhausted. Maybe Mm -hmm. your skin will be dry because it very much regulates your body's hydration levels. Your Mm -hmm. hair might fall out or break because your body's not using protein properly because thyroid hormone is needed by every single cell to utilize glucose and that is how our cells actually create energy and that is what we feel when we feel energized and we feel good and we feel vibrant that's our body being able to take raw materials and create atp or energy within the mitochondria boom okay i'm gonna test myself yeah um one question t4 produced by the liver or somewhere else t4 is primarily going to be produced by the thyroid itself got it Yep. So the thyroid stimulating hormone comes out of the pituitary yes. anterior? 
Uh, yeah, I believe so. I'm, just... I'm not sure. Don't quote me <laughs> on that one. All right, that's fine. It's the pituitary. <laughs> and then it goes to the thyroid, says, hey, hey, produce T4. Yep. Is that thyroxin? Or is yes. that? Okay. And then the thyroxin goes T4 to the liver to say to the liver, hey, let's turn mm -hmm. into T3. T3. Yes. And T3, no, so we'll, when we get our a full thyroid panel tested, they'll say T3, then there'll be free T3, and then there'll be reverse T3. And so yes. what a lot of people don't realize about thyroid hormone is that the hormones in the bloodstream, I always like to explain that the bloodstream is a highway for hormones, for minerals, and the body actually loves to keep blood levels of things as stable as possible. Mm -hmm. But it's not always a good reflection of what the cells themselves are doing. And the cells themselves still must receive the hormone mm -hmm. and they still must receive the sugar. And so a lot of people get so stuck on blood levels of things that they forget that what's going on in the tissues or the cells could be something very different. And this is why we're in this epidemic today of people that are running off of constant stress. They, they really rely on their adrenal glands to manufacture mm -hmm. them fuel, plus they're kind of stuck in that constant chronic state of survival, whether it be fight or flight, or they're kind of in that frozen mode mm -hmm. where everything is really slowed down. They don't realize that maybe their thyroid numbers will come back normal or in range yep. but their cells themselves are saying no way or not receiving the energy properly whether that's a protective mechanism it's very possible because thyroid hormone is an environmental response if our body doesn't have an abundance it's gonna slow down we're in a famine slow down got it yeah and then if we have enough and we're we're abundant and sun the sun is out there's fruit everywhere we're in a, in that like you know state of plenty our body says okay it's okay to use more you don't need to conserve energy mm -hmm. so it's really more of an environmental response than anything mm -hmm. else it's not a brokenness i think sometimes when people have thyroid issues or metabolic mm -hmm. issues they think i'm broken yeah. i need to be fixed and yeah. it's actually your body is just protecting you and it's just responding to the environment that it's that it has access to I like this because um, uh, last year my my hormones were shifting and I went to my normal GP whom mm. I love <laughs> and uh, she looked at my blood and she's like thyroid's, thyroid's great and I didn't challenge her I was like okay something's not right with what was going on and so then I sought out an ND an naturopathic doctor and he did the reverse t3 he looked mm. deeper into cortisol he looked deeper into inflammatory markers things that here in Canada you have to pay out of pocket for you will not mm. you will not get that from the medical system and I have the ability to do that and of course that came back and it was he's like yeah <laughs> thyroid is off um, he mm -hmm. did try me on a bioidentical thyroid and it made mm -hmm. me unwell. I couldn't mm -hmm. sleep. I was jittery. I'm never jittery. I'm like, that is, nope, not doing that. Mm -hmm. And that was around the time, Jessica, that I started to experiment with bringing in, and I eat carbohydrates. So it's not that I'm mm -hmm. not avoiding it. I'm not keto. I'm not carnivore, mm -hmm. but I added more um, deliberate carbohydrate mm -hmm. to my food and also in the evening and a little more dairy and this was again watching you with cottage cheese and and those sorts of things and slowly i noticed my energy shift and just had some panels done and it's improved significantly good so even someone myself who wasn't trying to restrict it was clear that you know i'm a i have quite a bit of muscle mass i'm using my brain a lot i okay. exercise most days um it, it was needed right and I've actually seen um, my weight stabilize in a way that I haven't in quite a while. So mm -hmm. it was interesting just to dabble with that. Um, where do you want to shift gears to? Because I think we've covered the importance of we need glucose, which comes from carbohydrate. We don't want to break our muscle down, the protein mm -hmm. down to make sugar. Yes. I fear that there's a lot of people that are in that state and have yeah. no clue. Yeah. Yeah, and I think the question that often comes up, maybe we can shift focus to, yeah. well, why do I feel so good when I'm intermittent fasting? Or why Please. do I feel so good when I'm in ketosis or eating low carbohydrate? 
And what I see is people's stress resilience varies, as you probably have found, mm -hmm. um, where some people can handle so much pressure and so much stress for such a long period of time, and then all of a sudden their body just crashes, and they say, I don't know what happened, like I was fine and then now I'm not. And then yeah. you'll see the people that are a lot more sensitive to stress where they might try something new and within three months their hair is just falling out, they can't sleep. And it really comes mm -hmm. down to uh, how, uh, where your minerals are at as going in. So minerals are a big Thank one you. that I know it's like a whole nother rabbit hole. That's okay. Um, <laughs> But mineral, our, our body's minerals are very much determined by how our mother eats while we're in the womb. And mm. then on top of that, just what our diet and lifestyle is leading up to the point we're stressed. A lot of us are very depleted in our key minerals, such as calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium, and then even our trace minerals, such as selenium and iodine. And we all kind of are coming from very different places. So I always say, go, go work with a practitioner, get a hair tissue mineral analysis yeah. done, and you can really see where your intracellular minerals are at because intracellular minerals are what matter and they are what actually helps you respond to blood glucose properly and respond to thyroid hormone properly and you can think of your minerals as almost your body's armor when you're depleted in minerals you have all these like chinks in your armor little holes in your mm -hmm. armor and stress is going to be able to poke through but as you remineralize you become this full suit of armor to where your nervous system becomes a lot more resilient because it has such a high need for magnesium and calcium and your cells become a lot more resilient to stress because now they're full of potassium as they should be mm -hmm. so minerals play a big role in metabolism and thyroid function but they also just play a big role in your your body's resilience and these diets that induce a backup system such as keto or carnivore or res more restrictive diets we can say anything like maybe unintentional carbohydrate deficient diets I that's kind of what I say because a lot of I people like are eating carbohydrates and they're like I eat carbs but they're maybe not eating enough or yeah. calories in general or eating enough carbohydrates for their activity and that includes both brain activity and muscle activity and what begins to happen is when your body's in its backup system it often is going to rely on our adrenaline and cortisol like we talked about before and these uh, hormones are actually diuretics so our body burns through minerals much at a much mm -hmm. faster rate and if you're familiar with the uh, Dr. Hans Selye's uh, general adaptation syndrome, yeah. which is kind of that state of, as the body goes into that state of alarm, what will happen is the body's burning through its resources faster. So when we're in a fight or flight state, when we're in a state of survival, our body actually has to burn through resources faster because it's trying to put blood flow to our muscle, all the tissues we would need to survive, our heart, our mm -hmm. circulatory system. Mm -hmm. But again, that is debt that we rack up that we pay for later. So to pool all our resources, we're using all our resources at a much faster rate. And this is what happens when someone's in a, in a state of intermittent, where they're doing just extended fasting, pushing their body to fast, 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 doing constant ketosis or in constant state of ketosis or doing carnivore. It can feel really good when your adrenaline's very high or your cortisol is very high. I mean, mm -hmm. I, most of us have been in a state of adrenaline where we go through, through like a near death experience oh, or yeah. something crazy happens and we're like, oh my gosh, I survived. And you kind of feel good while it's happening. And afterwards the crash is just, Oof. I think of it kind of as when you're running from an angry bear and let's say you step on a rock and you break your ankle, you're going to keep running because yeah. you have that adrenaline. But once you're in a safe place and you've, and, and you come to that calm down, that ankle is destroyed because you not only broke it, you, you ran on it too. And that is kind of the, what the phenomenon that's happening is what I see is women tend to have less stress resilience because of our high estrogen levels, um, whereas men have more testosterone, which makes them a little bit more resilient to stress. And so women will go on these very restrictive, carbohydrate restrictive diets, and they will find that after a year or two, what once felt so good doesn't feel so good anymore. And they have to go more and more restrictive. They kind of will go from like paleo to keto to carnivore. And then it's like, well, I've been fasting for 12 hours. Maybe I'll fast for 14. Or maybe I'll, you know, do one meal a day. And you see this cadence of people where they're like, I, I physically cannot do anything more. Like I'm on a very restrictive diet. I'm fasting for most of my day. What am I doing wrong? 
And this is the crash, the come down from the adrenaline that can feel so good, but can take such a toll on our system. And it does feel good in the moment. It also will feel very inflammation suppressive because yeah. cortisol is very anti-inflammatory. That's why we get corticosteroids cortisol, injected yeah. Yeah. when we have issues uh, or inflammatory issues. But uh, it does take its toll and it has debt that we have to pay later, unfortunately. It's fascinating to me, and, and I'm not surprised that this has become a trend because it's almost like, and I look macro at this, humanity's last, last push before we realize, okay, we really shouldn't be trying to live in survival anymore. Yes. You know, it's, we're, not, we're not in that domestication of plants and animals where we're trying to grow crops and figure out how to find food. It's like, it's plentiful. But it's like we're trying to swing back to what it used to be like. Yes. You know, where you would have the hunt and you would be, like you said, there'd be prosperous food supply and then you might go into more of a fasting situation in the winter, yeah. more hibernation, but you don't stay in that fasting situation yeah. all year round. Do you have any thoughts on just kind of the cultural reasons why this has become, you know, putting weight loss and body image aside like have you thought about like why is this so popular and i've also found that people are protective of this like yes. so protective this is who i am this is what i do um, and there's no deviation yes yes it's it's almost like a tribal like protection yeah. Yes, yeah, so I had to learn this the hard way myself because as I started this nourishment journey, I had still had a lot of, of dysregulation, nervous system dysregulation, mm -hmm. and I was still much just kind of existing from a place of trauma. Yeah. And um, I learned very quickly that when I started to nourish my body appropriately and properly and practice food frequency, what mm -hmm. began to happen was all of my junk started bubbling up. It was impossible to keep it down anymore. Before, I was able to just run away from all my problems. I was running constantly, you know, like, I am good, everything's great. And I truly think that it's a, it's a sign of such a dis, uh, of a, just a group of such dis, we're also nervous system dysregulated, yeah. that what happens is we uh, we don't feel comfortable in a state of peace. We don't feel comfortable in a state of calm. That's discomfort right there. Mm -hmm. To have the complete freedom to go to the pantry and create a meal that we enjoy and mm -hmm. find pleasure in. No, we need a battle. We need to be in a war, war. constantly <laughs> <I love laughs> with that. ourselves and food and anything. We seek it out because adrenaline feels more comfortable to us mm -hmm. than peace and calm and regulation and I have truly seen that with just everybody that I've worked through is the people that have the hardest time uh, separating themselves from these kind of very stress-based eating styles are the ones that are the most dysregulated and they feel more comfortable it almost is a fear to get to a place of just re emotional regulation and sure that might carry be carried by some baggage around weight they don't want to gain weight um they want to keep their weight very, very small or lean or thin. Um, and it, there, there might be some fears behind that as well. But at the center of it all, it's really a, almost an adrenaline addiction that they cannot stop. Um, you know, they cannot stop. And we see this with the cold therapy, the cold plunges, which just induces a, a huge dopamine. state of adrenaline and yeah. dopamine. Um, so we have this kind of this, the stress, it just, if they love the stress and we have to get ourselves out of that stress response. And sometimes, you know, food is not enough. As you know, mm -hmm. it, it takes a lot more than just the food. Food can be a catalyst, but it is not the end game. Amen. Love it. Um, you said something right before what you were just saying, food frequency. Hmm. Because that is like the opposite to what, it's like we were taught eat three square meals a day. That was like my parents and grandparents generation and always have a midnight snack. Yes. And then towards the, you know, and then it flew into, you know, if you're always having to eat every couple hours, something's not right. Like, how do you, like, what do you say to that, Jessica? Hmm. What's going on? And my sense is it's gonna change. Like if you're yes. not doing a lot, you might not have the same need for the caloric intake versus if you're off on a hike traveling and it's a little stressful, that kind of thing. 
Absolutely. Yeah, so your food, what I mean by food frequency is just mm-hmm. simply using your the frequency that you eat as a tool or intentionally to support your body's stress response. Mm-hmm. So when your body, we talked about before how the liver is going to manufacture you glucose all day, every day. Yep. And the liver is also the one that's running your metabolism and detoxifying. And so when you've been in a state of constant stress for so long, you've maybe been going long periods without eating intentionally or unintentionally fasting hardcore, low carving it, a liver actually needs about 130 grams of glycogen or stored glucose Mm -hmm. to function optimally. So what a lot of people do is they're, when they're doing these long-term fasts, what they're doing is they're depleting their liver glycogen stores to almost empty. The liver won't completely empty, but it will put, they'll push it, push it, push it, and then they'll, they may or may not refill it. But most people, if they're intermittent fasting and doing low carb, their liver is never actually becoming full of glycogen. And so their liver is becoming worse, or it becomes harder and harder for the liver to be able to store enough glucose to function well. And then we can no longer regulate our, our glucose levels. So this is what we see is when people realize keto is not working, this long-term intermittent fasting is not working, they will start to eat carbohydrates again, and their blood sugar just starts to go boom, 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 because mm-hmm. they cannot store enough sugar to keep I their see. blood sugar levels stable anymore. And so... As a kind of a technique or or a way to heal, almost a therapeutic tool, I encourage people to eat breakfast within about 30 minutes to an hour of waking because you've already gone through your your fast. You fast naturally while you sleep. Yeah. Eat when you wake up, and when you when your liver is not functioning well, you will have zero appetite in the morning. That is a sign that your mm-hmm. liver is a little bit stressed out. And so sometimes it takes time to get that appetite up because it's kind of a vicious cycle. Liver needs fuel, so when it doesn't have fuel, it, it doesn't function well, and then it kind of goes to, I don't feel hungry for fuel, and so you don't eat, and then it goes into that vicious cycle. So sometimes mm-hmm. you have to intentionally push your body out of that stress state by having a little bit of something when you wake up, usually within 30 minutes to an hour of waking. And then what I usually recommend is a period of a frequency of about three to five hours. So just having a small snack mid-morning. It doesn't have to be something big. It can be like half a banana dipped in some you know, almond butter or nut butter, or you can have um, just a little bit of some yogurt with, a, you know, with a little jam. It doesn't have to be something crazy. And then you can kind of go on to your main meals. And this is going to go be different for every single person. Some people, when I first start working with them, they need to eat every two hours. Yeah. They are so, they cannot regulate their own blood sugar at all. And, and that is what actually ends up keeping them content and feeling well and energetic yeah. and resilient to stress. And then over time, as your liver begins to be able to store fuel well, mm-hmm. you can kind of use food frequency more more to your own prerogative as a tool. So if you're under stress or like you said, you're going on a hike or you're doing, you're an athlete or you're somebody that requires a huge amount of brain power, Mm -hmm. you might actually want to snack a little bit so your body doesn't have to constantly make you fuel. But you can use it more as a tool and eat kind of more when you're hungry. As your body gets out of a stressed out state, your hunger cues become a lot more reliable. When you're stressed, your hunger cues are not going to be very reliable at all because your brain to body connection is just not really there it's pooped out yeah what you said that never so would this be when you mentioned if someone's been fasting so much and they're not replenishing their liver glycogen which I used to talk about a lot I used to teach sports nutrition and that was Mm -hmm. a huge thing is making sure liver glycogen muscle glycogen is stored up and packed so there's reserves yes when you just said that that you know you wake up in the morning and you're not hungry it's because the liver isn't craving that, that fuel, that glycogen, yes. that was like a big bell went off in my brain. I'm like, that makes so much sense. Yes. Is this why, I'm just making a hypothesis, someone might end up getting a diagnosis of diabetes, but, they're, but they have no fat on them. They're skinny, skinny, skinny. And we often associate, say, diabetes with being a little more over fat and not metabolically healthy. Right. Have you seen that where there is diabetes that occurs because there's been so much deprivation of calorie? Yeah, that's actually a lot of times why diabetes is occurring. Um, It's a, I look at diabetes and all metabolic issues as a body that is starving 
but at the mm-hmm. same time cons- trying to conserve. Right. So the cells themselves are maybe not being provided the glucose that mm-hmm. it, that they need. And this is why people, I have worked with so many people who are still low carb or keto, and they'll wake up and their blood sugar levels are sky high sky high where is that glucose coming from because yeah you're making it a lot of people will say well what did you eat the night before did you eat carbs the night before and it's like your body will probably use the carbohydrates from the night before so where's that glucose coming from and it's oftentimes we're actually waking up we've already been manufacturing our own glucose for hours and this will usually actually show where where people cannot sleep well. They'll have that wake up, that 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m. wake up time where they'll just wake up and their mind will start racing. They can't go back to sleep. They can't calm themselves down. Mm -hmm. It's because your body is now secreting adrenal hormones to keep your brain and your central nervous system fueled. Glucose. Yep. Yeah. This is, and I've been, I've actually been hearing this more and more from female friends that they're having trouble sleeping through the night. Mm -hmm. And, um... They're, the last thing they're thinking about typically is their fuel. Mm. It's like it must be a trauma. It must be an ascension symptom. Yes. It must be you know the galaxy is in whatever retrograde. <laughs> right. And you know okay, but if it keeps happening and it keeps happening, it's like look at the biology. What's going on? And I would yes. say that my sleep has improved dramatically since having a little bit of food right before bed. And like you said, it's not a meal. It's literally like a scoop of sour cream or something like that. Exactly. So. It's just a little fuel to get you through your night so your body doesn't have to. Survive. Survive. (laughs) And a lot of people might say, well, why we never had to do this before, but we live in a very different society. We're under so much stress, you know, Mm -hmm. financial stress, traffic. Um, We have, uh, you know, EMFs all around us. There's just so many different Mm -hmm. factors that our system has to wade through. Mm -hmm. And I say the human body is so resilient and it can be very resilient to its environment and it can coexist very peacefully amongst all these stressors as long as it has the tools and resources to do so and the support to do so but uh people get caught up in the fear and the oh no and i gotta restrict and oh no this is damaging me and this is dangerous and we're going Mm -hmm. right back into that fear-based war mentality Mm -hmm. of like it's me and that you know this environment i'm at war Mm -hmm. and so i encourage people to instead focus on at making your your body res- as resilient as possible with what is available to you. So for cycling women, I will often say, you know, optimize your ovulation so you're making enough progesterone and that's mm-hmm. going to make you more resilient. Um, but anybody and everybody can focus on their thyroid and their adrenal function through fueling themselves correctly and nourishing themselves well. And getting yourself out of that undernourished state will be a game changer to your ability to show up, your energy, how you respond to what's going on around you. Like you said, you know, I always see people talking about like, oh, I'm not sleeping and it's this and it's that. And sometimes it's as simple as like, you just need to eat a little bedtime snack, just a little, like just a little fuel before you go to bed and your life might change. So simple. And I mean, I changed my thyroid without going on any kind of medication or even supplement. And it was just through these little tiny tweaks. So um it's possible and um one final specific question do you think it's possible to get all of these trace minerals and minerals without some form of supplementation these days Mm. um i'll answer my that first myself i have started supplementing with trace minerals with fulvic acid um, with magnesium i i put electrolytes in my water I've noticed a huge difference with that. What's your take on that, Jessica? Yeah, so it just depends on how hard you want to work. It's possible. It's very possible. Um, There's so much amazing food available to us now. And if you're Mm -hmm. willing to want to like kind of learn where to get potassium and how to add more potassium to your diet, Mm -hmm. but it can get kind of stressful, especially if you're Mm -hmm. not in a place where you want to, you know, look at I usually will recommend an app called chronometer and it kind of take keep, keeps track of your micronutrients and so you can kind of just see what you're eating in a day and see where your your biggest spaces are where you're, what you're missing mm-hmm. but it can be a full-time job and I mm-hmm. usually will say you know try to get as much food-based supplementation so I will usually say instead of synthetic zinc you know opt for desiccated oysters mm-hmm. or instead of synthetic iron and copper you know opt for desiccated liver you know yeah. so looking for more food-based sources because the body tends to you 
utilize them better because it has the natural cofactors. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, usually some type of supplementation is required, especially if your body is just so burned out and you're just so depleted. It can just take years and years and years to get yourself out of that place with food. Yeah. Food is the foundation. I've seen so many people who rely too heavily on supplements and are not doing the food frequency, not balancing their protein, carbs, and fat, and are finding that they just are burnt, continue to burn through minerals because they're just continually very stressed. But then on the flip side, I've seen people that just try to use food and food is just not quite enough and a little yeah. supplementation can go a long way. A long way. Thank you. And I will yeah. say I did, in my shift of thyroid, I was putting in more liver real mm. liver. We were making pate yes. at home with good butter. Um, I was doing the zinc um, in capsule, which also mm. offers copper and all the other trace minerals. So yeah. there's so many new options out there that yeah. I don't think were around even 20 years ago with these organs that are being freeze dried into capsules. So absolutely. There's so much. options. Yeah, there's so many options. Um, just a quick note, let people know where to find you, what you offer, um, all the good places to follow you. Yeah, yeah. So I primarily am active on Instagram and my handle is Jessica Ash Wellness. I also have a blog where I take those posts if you're not on Instagram and you still want to read, my blog is, is the place to be. And I do send out a weekly newsletter as well and via email. Um, and then my main offering is, is my course called Fully Nourished, which I teach all these principles that we discussed. And then I also offer a private community where you can grow and expand and really talk to like-minded individuals as as well but that is my main offering that people really enjoy and we've yeah. had about 6,000 students go through that now and yeah. just some amazing amazing stories thank you I'm one of those students I'm learning so thank you so, um, so much and your emails are great so I'm just gonna say to everyone I know who wants another email into their inbox Absolutely. but yours are really good and they're fun and they're just authentic so if anything folks start following your emails jessica's emails and um just let's get all fully nourished yes absolutely yeah thank you so much thank you for having me you're welcome